Hey guys, how's it going? Sammy here. We've recently hit 100 subscribers on YouTube. Thank you so much for all the support. Thank you so much for hitting that subscribe button. Thank you for inviting your mom, your brothers, your sisters, and everyone you know basically to my YouTube channel. Thank you so much. <laughs> Let's talk about Xenoblade Chronicles. I'm actually a totally addicted fangirl to Xenoblade Chronicles. I've already played it on the Wii when it was released. I basically bought my Wii U just for Xenoblade Chronicles X and obviously I've also pre-ordered Xenoblade Chronicles 2 and yeah, it's also the only game I've played so far on my Switch, actually. I actually created even fan sites for Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and X, but they are in German, so for most of the viewers that's not really interesting, but you can still check them out. I'm gonna show the links somewhere around here. I've spent, like, on both games, Xenoblade Chronicles and Xenoblade Chronicles X, um, close to 500 hours, I believe. Other players that helped me with filling in the data obviously put even more hours into those games. For Xenoblade Chronicles 2, it's a little bit different because I didn't make a fan site for it since I don't have the time and we played it on stream. So I was focused on following the story, playing it through and not grinding at all. So my playthrough experience differed from my playthrough experience with the other games because playing the other games, I always focused on uh, exploring every single bit and collecting every bit of information. So I'm putting that out there as a warning because I am aware that maybe um, some of my opinions on Xenoblade Chronicles 2 might be influenced by that, that I have like way more knowledge about the first two games. Also an important bit of information for you, if you didn't play the game, I'm not gonna spoil anything important for the story for now. I'm gonna do that in my conclusion, but I will give you a big fat warning basically at the point where you have to turn off. But if you're not very far in the game, I might spoil for you um, some party members, some team members that will join your party, and I might also spoil some um, game mechanics for you in the battle system and so on. First of all, we have the character design, which changed a lot um, in comparison to the previous games. The new character design is more childish, more anime-ish, and also more sexualized, like the main uh, woman, basically. The main romance has, of course, the biggest boobs. Like, the big boobs um, are also used on the characters that seem, like, very kind and, like, they are enhancing the stereotypes this game also pursues. And don't get me wrong, I love weep games, I love animes. I just like the more mature design of the previous versions. If it comes to the level design, though, um, Xenoblade Chronicles seems to never disappoint. Um, the world is colorful, it's huge, it has lots of details, it invites you to explore all of it. Um, you're really diving into it naturally. I think it just looks pretty. I'm not talking about sharp details in regards of quality, I'm talking about essence of it. Having all these small cool little details which makes the world look really deep gives me this exciting feeling that I want to explore it all. The game also features stuff like uh, hidden places, hidden landmarks and actually exploring and discovering these is so much fun because they actually look really pretty. And the next small, rather not as important thing is the soundtrack, though that's really that really differs from person to person. I think the soundtrack is good, it's atmospheric, though my viewers did uh, have some songs they were really annoyed at when I was like for a long time in Gourmet, for example. So I can't really tell, it might be me. On the other hand, I do remember a song from Xenoblade Chronicles X, for example, that was really going on to my nerves, but I will have to mention that on the other hand, I I also don't remember much memorable songs and that was definitely different for Xenoblade Chronicles 1 where story twists and plot twists came always with a very exciting music and I'm still today memorizing bits of that melody but overall I would say the the common music like for the areas was on a similar quality to Xenoblade Chronicles 1 overall a little bit worse I would say the soundtrack of Xenoblade Chronicles 1 felt overall more memorizable Thank you. 
Next, let me give a short comment on the difficulty. There is no overall difficulty setting and we played it on stream, as I said. We didn't do any grinding. We just tried to finish the story as soon as possible. And for me, the difficulty was actually good. It was overall felt like a normal difficulty and in the end it went straight up since I didn't do any grinding and the final boss battle was actually a little bit of a struggle for me but I still managed to do it so it felt really rewarding after finishing the game. But that leads me to the assumption the casual playthrough will actually be too easy. By that I mean um, experienced RPG players but not like the kind of RPG player that does every little bit. For players that are seeking like for the end game for real challenges, Xenoblade Chronicles as always offers uh, some optional challenges after finishing the story and also you can decide to not level up at the inns. It's not like you wouldn't gain any experience since the experience you get from fights you get right away but the experience from side quests and other stuff um, you only get when going to the inn. So you can create some extra challenges for you. I'm just saying that I think for the casual but still experienced RPG player uh, who's also following the story mostly it might be a bit too easy. But that was honestly the same with Xenoblade Chronicles 1. If you're a casual player, that's a good thing. It means you can just play the game, enjoy the story, and will not have to worry that you have to put multiple hours into grinding. Let me talk to you about the characters first. You might already have guessed like we have like a more childish, more anime style of game and obviously also our main characters in this story are very stereotypical and even very shallow at some points. So we have Rex who is our main guy, our main hero. He's kind, he's courageous, he's naive, so he doesn't really express his emotions very well to the um, his main girl his main waifu in this game. Yeah, I would say it's it's not boring, but it's a character we've seen in so many RPGs. Next up we have Pyra, which is basically his supposed to be waifu. Um, she's, she's very kind too, she's humble, she has obviously the biggest boobs of all the girls, at least at that point in the game. It's kind of embarrassing how obvious that is in the game. Like, oh, okay, that's my wife. She has the biggest boob, obviously. Um, she's also always blushing. Like, she's like the, 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 the perfect girl stereotype, basically. Super pretty, super big boobs, very humble. Um, never saying anything as offensive. Never, like, always, always basically um, taking herself back for everybody else. And then we have the other girl which is Nier. Nier is very stubborn, she's smart, she's more of the body type of a girl and obviously she has very small boobs so that we can, we know the obviously attractive girl is Pyra and not this body type girl over here. And then we have Tora. Tora is a nopon. Let me put this straight, I love the nopons. They are very cute. They're, it's like the special race in the Xenoblade Chronicles series and they have so cute voices, they have such a cute dialect and Tara just as Ricky and the first deal by Chronicles is kind of like the team clown. He's like doing the edgy jokes, he's like ludicrous, like he's he's the guy you're sometimes a little bit embarrassed for. Yeah and later on, I'm not gonna call the names, you might still imagine who it is, um, we will get a very cool and tough woman. Um, Nia is actually somewhat tough too, but like this woman is gonna like not gonna have the temper and not gonna have the immaturity. Nia impersonates. Um, and then we're gonna have a guy who's like very clumsy and a total fool sometimes but still obviously very brave and has a kind heart. Honestly, you could like imagine any character from other RPGs here that um, have exact this, exactly this description. I don't mean to shit on the game for it, but I think it's a bit sad because actually I felt that's something that wasn't as bad in the previous games. The characters in Xenoblade were, were always stereotypical, but I felt they had some more depth and some more diversity than in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Alright, about story development, it starts very very exciting. Like, um, you're 
hooked up uh, pretty fast and we don't have to wait multiple hours until uh, shit goes down. So um, I really enjoyed the start of the game. It, it really hooks you up. It leaves you with a lot of questions. Um, honestly, the, the main thing also Monola did and which was really smart is um, like we know there's Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and then we know here's Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Like we're playing this game the whole time searching for those relations and like we know there has to be a relation since we already had Xenoblade Chronicles X which kind of had the concept of um, similarity, subtle hints but not the same world, not the same story, so we knew there must be some deep relation in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. And there actually is. There actually is a deeper relation. Um, I'm not gonna spoil that, obviously. Not right now, at least. Um, but yeah, like, that adds to the tension. Always looking for those relations, speculating with every little bit you see. So we go highly motivated in the story, we're very excited for answers, we're very excited uh, to, for the relation between Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and Xenoblade Chronicles 2, they did a splendid job on that part. I have to say though, in the middle part of the game, um, even though I'm not gonna say it gets boring or anything, but uh, there is sometimes like this fake progress, I'm gonna call it. It's like, it's like there are chapters that feel like filler episodes in TV shows. Like, they still give you some progress like in, in game mechanics or some stuff changes, but the bigger plot um, is not really progress at all. They just give you some more confusing hints which are not answers. They just give you some something to, to, to grab on, to try to grasp and you literally can't because there is not more info than before. It's not exactly repetitive, but um, but still it's it's like, some sort of fake progress and like I I'm not criticizing a game to not make much story progress in the middle of it like to to give us some some more content to give us some more mechanics we can play around with I don't mind that but what I did mind is that they trying to sell it as big story progress by as I said giving you some subtle hints which is actually nothing new and hyping that up I can't like it's it's difficult to explain but I but I felt betrayed a little bit here and there and so in the middle of the game actually the high tension dropped a little bit for me but nevertheless in the end it gets very exciting again so it wasn't like a true weakness like I, at no point I felt like um, not playing anymore. Like I was still addicted to it. I still enjoyed the game uh, I'm just gonna say that it felt like the the story progression in the middle of the game felt sometimes off Let's talk about the battle system. There are three roles for the characters. It's healer, it's attack, it's tank. That's actually nothing new I don't think I have to go more into detail. You're fighting with three people and the best setup usually is to play exactly one of those each. The battle system is uh, real time in a way. You have like auto attacks which are executed automatically if you're standing next to an enemy. Um, they are not executed when you're running around, which used to be the case. Um, so you actually have to stand still. And those auto attacks charge your skills. It's a lot about timing since um, the perfect uh, skill execution is if you do it right after an auto attack. Basically, it's a lot of about finding the rhythm for your skills and your auto attacks. And the rhythm of your auto attacks differs with every weapon you wear. That's all already about it, about like perfect skill auto attack execution. You only have three skills available in battle. Um, that's by like by far less than in the previous games. Um, there are other mechanics, but, but still you only have those three. But since and they charge pretty fast, you still have enough to do during the battle. Then we have specials. Specials are like your super attack. They also charge with executing skills. Um, and they charge even more if you time the skills perfectly. And the special thing about specials is that you combo them with your other teammates and the different element combinations um, result in different super combos, which with different effects and different damage output. That's actually at first 
quite poorly explained in the game, I feel at least. Um, but once you understood how it works, it's pretty easy to master. Then the last thing to the battles are the blades. The blades are basically like a version of Pokemon, you could say. They provide your character with some passive abilities, which they will learn over time, but also those persona actually decide which weapon you are carrying, which role you are playing, and which element you have, which element special you have currently. So you can have three blades at a time, and it allows you to also cheat like a little bit. For example, if you have a healer and he has three healing blades, he can actually switch through those blades and use like a very powerful healing attack uh, right one after another. But you will have a cooldown to switch back to a blade you just used. What I like about the blades, it kind of gives you a feeling of gotta catch them all. You're actually finding some uh, cores in the game. It's like opening loot boxes really. <laughs> but they're actually for free. And you have a chance to find some rare ones, like there are some common blades, which is basically generic shit you should never um, really fight with anyways. Um, and then you have those rare ones you can open. And um, yeah, those are the really interesting ones. So the game actually takes forever to introduce you to all of the details of the battle system. We had like this meme going on while we played the game, like, <laughs> Level 60, another tutorial. And that actually happened. It's really slow on giving you some of the features. I don't know if it's like a plus or a minus like on my side, because obviously it's nice if you have new stuff to play around with. But there were some features I really missed in the early game. Like I was waiting for having the chain attack available forever. <laughs> also, I have to say, even though at first it looks kind of complex, the whole battle system and you will need a little bit of time to master like basically the rhythm of it, to master the special combos. It felt pretty dull at some point. You could still play around trying out different roles to get a little bit more insight of those, but like even though you have like a huge amount of blades and also a huge amount of different weapons which uh, offer different skills, the skills are very similar. There are skills that deal more damage from the side, from behind, from in front of them. Um, there are skills that um, decrease the aggro uh, you have on opponents. Like it, It's just very similar. So I never felt incentivized to really play around with all the different weapons um, and the blades. It ca really came down to um, which blades do have the strongest passive abilities and which element specials do I want to use. And that leads into the next point, which is balancing. Um, it leads into that because I think one big issue with the balancing is actually the um, enemy HP and I do understand the enemy HP especially in the mid game it's really it's pretty bad so we have a battle system which is based on executing huge combos but these combos need time you have to charge your specials like up to level three four and that in order what happens is the developer gave the normal really normal enemies that don't even look huge big amounts of HP so you actually can execute those combos so you actually have enough time to execute those combos but that leads into the point that it gets really boring as soon as you master that special system. Especially in the mid game, I felt pretty bored of the fight since I figured out the combos I have available and the fights just took too long. I mean, on the other hand, you are able in Xenoblade Chronicles to basically um, sneak through most of the enemies, but that feels kind of wrong, right? Um, I still did that for most of the part actually, like because I didn't want to bore my viewers with such really long fights. I started sneaking around everywhere. Still, I'm gonna say, in, in my mind, it's a it's a little bit of a balancing issue, but I, I understand where the problem like comes from. Like, if you wanna go for those insane combos, and if you wanna enjoy those insane combos, you have to 
craft enemies which large enough HP. But I will say that the balancing with the battle system is the biggest issue in the mid game. In the late game you will be given new tools to have more burst damage. There's one other thing I want to mention which I think really suck. Really early on in the game you are alone with Rex, the main character, and the whole battle system is based on playing with three characters because you have the roles and you have the special combos. If you're alone you're basically fucked. But the game doesn't really tell you and at the same time you're basically like thrown into the this new big huge area garment which looks really pretty and you're so engaged and motivated to explore this pretty place um, and then you will notice that just every second step you will die <laughs> and that felt horrible like that felt like turning off the players and not rewarding them for being curious like it's it's like I don't know they introduce you to this huge pretty area they will turn you on about exploring this world exploring the battle system getting super strong and then you will just get wrecked in almost any every battle so you will just feel like a piece of shit the player will not necessarily have the knowledge at that point to understand that he is naturally that weak alone at that spot. Also Xenoblade Chronicles always had the specialty of putting in stronger enemies in every area so you always have to watch your watch your steps basically and I've always liked that because it gives you some endgame content you can return to you can explore new areas and you can show them who's boss. I didn't really mind that it's just really that even enemies on your level at that point are really really tough so yeah the truth is at that part you just have to rush through continue with the story until you're not alone anymore yeah I, I felt it was like poor timing on introducing you to this huge beautiful area because you will get just naturally turned off the game could have told you that you should focus on progressing the story for now Now we're gonna get into the spoiler-free conclusion, so if you're trying to avoid spoilers, you're still welcome here at this point. First of all, I'm gonna summarize what I've said in short points. About the graphics, great level design, I didn't like the less mature style of the new Xenoblade Chronicles. The soundtrack was nice, but nothing too memorable. The gameplay had two very strong points for me, that was like the, the blades, the introduction of the blades, the feeling of gotta catch them all and playing around with those. Also the battle mechanics were pretty unique until the mid game at least and it became a little bit dull, but they managed to add some new f features in the end. Um, so overall I think we, we're even on that, it was still pretty fun. And also I'm gonna acknowledge the fact that I didn't spend as many hours on this game than the previous ones, so it could be, it could be that if I spent actually more hours on it that I might have found some more depth in it that I kind of missed. The story was overall very exciting, uh, it started really strong and it was a little bit weak in the mid game but it also ended very exciting. Also that's just my opinion, I really know. But uh, the world was smaller than the one in Xenoblade Chronicles X. Also Xenoblade Chronicles X was actually open world. And I really like that. But I know I'm kind of alone with that because I know lots of people were overwhelmed with the huge world in Xenoblade Chronicles X and actually didn't like that. Uh, but I actually love that. I love the this huge world to explore you, that you could even fly through it so I, I kind of miss that a bit but that's just my opinion I know lots of people like the fact that the world is smaller again so even though I criticized the game quite a bit I still think Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is a great game um, I'm so harsh on it because I played Xenoblade Chronicles 1 I played Xenoblade Chronicles X and I'm obviously comparing the new part to those games and I think just there are some weaknesses in comparison. But don't get me wrong, every part of Xenoblade Chronicles had some weaknesses. But still, it's a great game. If you didn't play the game and you have a Switch available, I will definitely uh, recommend to buy and play it. It's one of the greatest RPGs still. It's really fun, it was really addictive, even though there were those weaknesses. There was never a point I considered not to play the game the following day. 
really, 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 really good game. In the last part, I'm gonna actually talk about uh, the story conclusion, about how it all ended, how I interpreted it, and what I think about that. Um, I'm not gonna do a whole review in a spoiler version, I'm just gonna like do a spoiler inclusive uh, conclusion. So if you don't want to get spoiled, stop the video now. But before you stop the video, hit that fucking like button. Um, if you didn't yet, hit that subscribe button. And obviously uh, watch all my streams, tell your family, tell your mom, um, and join the Discord and Twitter. And I don't know. See you. And now guys, it's time. Are you ready for the spoiler part? Here we are, people that already played Xenoblade Chronicles 2 or don't care about being spoilered. And let me tell you this, if you've hoped that I would tell the whole story for you since you didn't play the game and just want to hear about the story, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna recap the whole story, I'm just gonna spoil you. <laughs> First of all, the thing that was really, really important for me was the relation be between Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Like, the whole game, I was sitting there speculating about relations. How did I like the conclusion about Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and Xenoblade Chronicles 2? It it's kind of interesting because they are playing at the same time. Basically, both games, both storylines are a consequence of the same event, but they are playing in different dimensions. I liked and hated that conclusion at the same time. I liked it because a it made sense and b it gave me another perspective on Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and it explained a lot about Xenoblade Chronicles 1 actually. But I also hated it because it was such a lame conclusion. It wasn't an actual relation. It's not like we will ever see those characters together. Also, they remained silent about some relations I thought that might be there, like the Ichises, like the 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 Mekon, the big Mekons. There were so many possible relations between those two and there are kind of relations because it's different dimensions, but it's not as straightforward relations that I thought it would be. The conclusion for me was good for playing Xenoblade Chronicles 1 again because it gives you such another perspective on that story. It kind of felt like the, the very confusing ending of Xenoblade Chronicles 1 finally made some sense. And still it was sad that those worlds were still different worlds. But I still acknowledge that it was a conclusion that made sense and it's would have probably sucked a lot if they did another ending like Xenoblade Chronicles 1 where we're just sitting afterwards with even more questions. And then there's another point I didn't like um, and that's, I mean, <laughs> people are gonna hate me, but Pyra should have stayed dead. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, even though Pyra has big boobs and has a very stereotypical Typical flat character, I liked her. Like, even though characters are flat and stereotypical doesn't mean I don't like them. But memorable things are emotions in games. And the moment Pyra was about to die was the one moment where I was sad in this game. And taking that away from me means that I'm kinda out of emotions for the ending. It gave me some answers, the ending but didn't give me much of emotions. The ending without being, like I, I'm not saying like Pyra being dead would have been the only thing they could have done, but since they already let her die, they should have let her die for real. Because yeah, in the end, the ending for Xenoblade Chronicles 2 at least is kind of boring. Like that's what it is. The ending for is for Xenoblade Chronicles 1 quite exciting because you get some background on that, but for Xenoblade Chronicles 2, it felt kind of boring. No, no deep emotions and actually like I think I might forget most of it in the end. I think after all Xenoblade Chronicles 1 with its characters and its story will have a deeper impression on me. And it's even more deepened by the ending of Xenoblade Chronicles 2. But um, I'm not completely disappointed or anything. The story was, was exciting, it was amazing, I enjoyed the game. I just think the game overall, and that's my third point, is a little bit weaker than Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and X. 
I know lots of people will argue with me about Xenoblade Chronicles 2 being worse than Xenoblade Chronicles X because obviously the story development in Xenoblade Chronicles X wasn't as good as in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. But for me, literally every other aspect in Xenoblade Chronicles X was better than in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. I liked the character design more. I liked the battle system more, it had more depth, it had more to explore for me. I liked the huge open world with way more stuff to explore. It's just that. And in Xenoblade Chronicles 1, the story was stronger for me. And the characters also had more depth for me. There were more important twists for me. In Xenoblade Chronicles 2, actually, we were memeing the game a lot of time, which isn't bad, like, we were fully entertained, right? And there were just so much similarities, so the Xenoblade Chronicles 1 story after all felt more original. And also, because I know many of the people didn't even complete Xenoblade Chronicles X, Xenoblade Chronicles X has actually a very exciting ending. And I would say that ending of Xenoblade Chronicles X also is stronger than this ending, since it's, I don't know, it, it's more intriguing. It's more intriguing than this ending. And the reason it's more intriguing is because they didn't let Pyro die. That's, I think, all I have to say about it. I still love every single of these games. I will respect an opinion I think that might occur in the commentaries, that might be that I didn't play enough of Xenoblade Chronicles 2. I will accept that opinion and I will respect it, but just see this as a review for the more casual but still diligent players. Alright guys, thank you so much for watching. If you liked the content, please uh, hit that like button. If you might like even more of my content, uh, please hit that subscribe button. Don't forget to invite your family over here and all your friends. Please also feel free to share your opinion on the game, on this review. Also, if you like this kind of content, like me doing a game review, is that any good? Alright, see you on the next one. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.